is on privacy preserving prediction by Cynthia Zwork and Vitaly Feldman. Vitaly will give the talk. Thanks. Thank you, Claudio. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll be uh, talking about learning with privacy, and this is joint work with uh, Cynthia Dwork from uh, Harvard. So, uh, first of all, we'll be uh, looking at the standard setting of supervised learning in which you're given a data set which consists of uh, n labeled examples, uh, which uh, for the most of talk, this talk will be thinking of as coming, as being drawn ID from some unknown distribution uh, P. And our goal is to be able to uh, predict the label of any uh, given point. So the additional constraint that we'll be interested in is uh, that of privacy. Specifically, we'll think of our data as, being collect as, as consisting of sensitive data of some uh, individuals. And we need to make sure that our analysis uh, preserves the privacy uh, of uh, these individuals. And uh, specifically, the, there is a standard approach to dealing with this problem which is uh, basically to use a differentially private uh, learning algorithm uh, to learn. And in case you haven't seen it, differential privacy is basically a notion of stability for randomized algorithm, which, uh, which requires that uh, the output distributions of that algorithm on any pair of data sets that differ in a single element are close. Specifically, the closeness is, uh, uh, is measured uh, as a sort of an upper bound on the ratio of uh, densities, and it is and one says that the algorithm satisfies epsilon differential privacy if this ratio is uh, upper bounded always by e to the epsilon. So uh, this has uh, setting this kind of approach to ensuring privacy has been studied for over 10 years. And we know that for many learning problems, uh, one can uh, achieve this, uh, ensure privacy with uh, relatively little overhead. But we also know that for some basic learning problems, there is sort of an, an inherent trade-off between privacy and accuracy that can be achieved. And this trade-off is particularly bad in high dimensions. For example, for the standard uh, sort of linear regression problems in, in D dimensions, we know that achieving uh, epsilon differential privacy requires roughly uh, D to the epsilon more data to achieve the same accuracy. And also in binary classification, say learning a linear classifier in D dimensions requires roughly uh, order d to the epsilon more data to achieve uh, uh, the same accuracy. And what this means is that in many settings we just won't have enough data to both have uh, uh, sufficient accuracy and reasonable uh, privacy guarantees. And the problem we'd like to address in this, uh, in this work is are there settings in which we can still do something even with, though we don't have enough data to, uh, to satisfy this model? And the basic insight uh, the, on which this work is based is that in most cases, the end users of uh, uh, these learning systems only care about predictions on their specific data points. For example, if I want to know what's my risk of uh, uh, having diabetes, I only care what's the risk for me, and I don't care about the model of how exactly it has been uh, derived. So corresponding to this view, uh, one can uh, view this whole system as, uh, in the following way. We can think of um, having some sort of prediction interface which has access to all this sensitive data uh, and allows users to ask queries on their data points. So specifically, it allows the, uh, a user to submit uh, some point in the domain and will answer with the prediction for that point. And then might allow the user to ask uh, more points and uh, potentially allow more than one user. And this setting, in, in order to ensure privacy, will uh, require that this whole transcript of this uh, interaction is produced in a differentially private way. So it's a pretty uh, natural uh, sort of model. It's also not uh, an abstract model. It's easy uh, to see that it actually corresponds to how many existing systems already work. For example, pretty much any online system will operate in a way where it only handles queries and does not reveal you the model that has been learned. So uh, one natural question uh, to ask is, is there even a privacy risk given this limited access to data? And uh, when we started working on this uh, uh, about a year ago, there was actually no um, evidence that there is an actual privacy risk. But since then, three groups have shown specific attacks on, uh, on system, which, uh, uh, which show that one can infer by looking only in a, at the model in a black box way, one can infer whether a certain point has been part of the data set or not. So um, the question is how, uh, okay, so we now have, have this model. We would like to say something about it. And we'll focus on two uh, specific aspects. First is sample complexity of these problems, which is kind of the most constrained resource. 
And secondly, we'll uh, look uh, at just answering a single prediction query. And the reason why we focus on this setting is that if we can do something useful for a single prediction query, we certainly can hope to do for more queries. Also, even uh, this setting is already sufficiently rich and theoretically interesting. One can also obtain answers of multiple queries from an algorithm for which answers a single query using just the standard composition properties of differential privacy, although that might not necessarily be the best way to go about it. So since we're only looking at single prediction query, we can uh, restrict our attention to, to the following definition, which we call differentially private prediction. And we say that the algorithm which uh, gets as an input uh, a data set and a single query point and outputs a label is, uh, has this epsilon differentially private prediction. If for every uh, query point x and every data set, this algorithm is epsilon differentially private with respect to the data set. So for every point, a specific, an answer on that query is differentially private. It's a pretty natural uh, definition. It, it's also not hard to see that it's quite closely related to the more standard notion of uniform stability from learning, which is kind of implicit in the work of Bousquet and Eliseev, which basically would ask that uh, uh, for a, an algorithm which outputs a real value prediction, would ask that the answers uh, of uh, sort of on two data sets which differ in a, in a single element on any uh, uh, point are within some parameter gamma. So these, uh, there are connections in both directions between these two notions. So, uh, uh, so what can we do for this definition? We first uh, look at sort of this very simple approach, which is called label aggregation, which has been studied in the context of other uh, problem in privacy. And it's a very simple approach. You split your data sets in k parts. You run your non -pri non -pri any arbitrary non-private algorithm on, on each of those separately. Then given a query point, you, you obtain hypothesis from each of those uh, cases. You, when, for a query point, you evaluate this k hypothesis on that point. Then you aggregate this label in a private way. And you can use any uh, simple algorithm for aggregation, such as exponential mechanism, proposed as reason, so on. And the nice thing is it doesn't, use any, any, doesn't need to know anything about the algorithm A. But at the same time, it can, if uh, the algorithm has additional properties like uniform stability, this can be exploited by this simple algorithm. So what do we prove for this algorithm, uh, for this very simple baseline system, is that uh, that achieves uh, that for these convex regression problems over uh, L2 ball of radius R, it achieves an uh, excessor which scales uh, roughly as uh, LR over epsilon, square root of epsilon n, which is just an, uh, the square root epsilon factor worse than doing this without privacy. And most importantly, uh, we do it, uh, we remove this uh, dependence on the dimension D that has been uh, present in the previous uh, this is a constraint of the previous model. We then look at doing this in this classification in a realizable pack model. There we show that one can do it with the overhead of just the achieve accuracy error alpha with just an overhead of roughly one over epsilon, which is much better than what you can do with privacy. And we also show the lower bound that this is, a match, uh, this is the best you can do. Finally, we look at the agnostic learning, and there the, the aggregation-based approaches do much worse. They actually have this pretty bad dependence on alpha and epsilon. Uh, and kind of the guarantees they give are, in some sense, incomparable to what you get uh, for learning with, with privacy. So we look at this uh, sort of, OK, so we look, is there something better one can do? Because we don't necessarily need to use aggregation. And to answer this question, uh, we look at the problem of thresholds on a line. The standard problems where you, the the class of functions where, which labels positive all the uh, um, points larger than a certain threshold and will discretize this uh, set to, to be M labels. And we know that this is like a standard learning class for which the VC dimension is one, but learning with differential privacy requires a number of samples which scales with the log logarithm in M. You can do slightly better if you allow uh, approximate differential privacy, but still there is dependence on M. And what we show that in this setting, uh, one can learn with a kind of optimal sample complexity of 1 over uh, alpha epsilon plus 1 over alpha square. And what's interesting here is that, OK, this is a new algorithm. And it's also, its analysis is also quite nice. Uh, basically, we use a class that has sort of infinite VC dimension. So we cannot directly uh, use uh, uh, sort of uh, uniform convergence. So uh, instead, we analyze the empirical error of this algorithm and then use the generalization property of this uh, uh, this prediction uh, of this prediction to derive generalization uh, bounds on generalization error of this error of this algorithm. So, as a bonus, in some sense, we prove that this uh, the, the definition that we have uh, introduced also satisfies uh, implies generalization, and the guarantees are somewhat different from the standard ones we know. 
So let me uh, conclude by uh, saying that we uh, have, well, there are a few, quite a few still uh, very interesting open problems. We still want to understand the sample complexity of general agnostic learning in this setting, and it has some very nice uh, connections to questions about stability, uniform stability. We specifically would like to understand how, uh, like, whether one can, what is the optimal sample complexity of learning linear threshold functions in d dimensions in this model. Of course, we're interested in other general approaches. Uh, and finally, of course, we need to uh, handle multiple queries. There have been already works which actually look at multiple queries in the context of aggregation. Uh, but uh, we would like to go beyond aggregation and do uh, better. Uh, that's it. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. All right. Let's thank the speaker first. Any questions? Please. Yes, so for, for none of these problems, uh, I, so for the lower bound, we prove lower bound that applies also for epsilon delta. And I wasn't uh, able to see any case where the approximate uh, differential privacy improves anything for these models. Uh, although in the setting of multiple queries, you would almost nece necessarily switch to approximate differential privacy because there you need to kind of use composition property and, and there you need approximate privacy. Uh, Philippe? So, Very quickly, sorry. So what happens if you, uh, so you want to go all the way to agnostic from, you know, what's the Pi model? What happens if uh, my model is slightly more than the Pi Do I have some sort of a stability guarantee on my uh, privacy, or is all everything Um Yes, actually, uh, the kind of guarantees that we give uh, for this for for aggregations are sort of multiplicative in terms of the distance to the uh, Basically, let's say you get twice the optimum plus some something. So this works for uh, for uh, um, a realizable setting; it's fine. But nice in agnostic setting, it gives you something worse, but still non-trivial if you have uh, something in in between. All right. Let's thank the speaker again. Well, okay, it's okay. You can skip. Uh, uh, I have another uh, talk. Uh, so uh, this is. Uh, on oh, sorry, work. Let, me just, let me just announce it. Let me do my work. <laughs> Again, Vitali is giving a talk uh, together with Thomas Steinke, calibrating noise to variance in adaptive data analysis. Thanks. Uh, yes, this is on joint work with uh, uh, Thomas Steinke, with whom we uh, were both, uh, uh, we've done this work at IBM Research uh, Alma Den, and who unfortunately could not uh, attend, so I'm uh, giving uh, this talk. So, uh, so, first of all, what's adaptive data analysis? It's uh, kind of a new look at this old problem in statistics, uh, which uh, basically, or all disconnect between the theory and practice, in which we analyze our learning algorithm and, and statistical procedures in general. We analyze them one at a time, as if they are run on fresh samples, ID samples. But in practice, uh, most uh, data analysis consists of many steps run over the same data set, and these analyses depend on each other. So, for example, there, uh, this can result from tuning parameters, doing trial and error, uh, and most importantly, sharing data sets. We run uh, many algorithms on, on the same data set. So, in practice, the, sort of the, uh, the, data, the life of data analysis looks more like this. You have uh, some analysts who run some analysis, obtain some value, run, uh, then having observed that value, picks a different analysis, and so on. And this is an interactive process which uh, involves many analysts. Uh, and because of these dependencies, our sort of standard view, theoretical view no longer applies. We can no longer infer, uh, say that that actually thinks that our yeah, basically that our analysis applies. And the question is: there some way to to still analyze this kind of uh, adaptive or interactive setting? And to analyze this setting, we have a uh, in a uh, joint work with uh, Dwork and others, we have introduced a, a simple model uh, which will specialize to. In this, uh, for this talk, for a simple case of uh, answering adaptive statistical queries. And in uh, this setting, the analysts, uh, the kind of analysis they want to perform are very simple. They all, all they want is to estimate the expectation of some function of a single data point. And, but they pick these functions in an adaptive way. And we'll assume that these functions are, have bounded range, real value functions with a range in 0, 1. And it's a natural uh, to parameterize it with some accuracy parameter tau. Uh, and uh, we'll ask for some probability uh, of success of 1 minus beta in general. So for this problem, 
So, uh, so it, this problem captures kind of uh, very well the difficulty of this problem. And, and one way to see it is to uh, notice it's not hard to see that if you actually just do it in a standard way, just use empirical means to estimate these expectations, then the number of samples that you would need in, in the worst case to obtain these, um, uh, these accuracy guarantees will scale linearly with the number of queries that you need to answer, which is very bad. Uh, but it turns out that if you just uh, add some noise with roughly, with variance being equal, uh, roughly equal to the uh, to the accuracy you are aiming uh, for, uh, then this will allow you to answer uh, to use the number of sample, which scales only as a square root of the number uh, of queries that you need to answer, and it's uh, quite surprising. Uh, uh, it's a relatively surprising result. And this uh, uh, and, and this result to basically to establish this result. Uh, uh, we have used uh, uh, tools from differential privacy, which I, I just have mentioned. In this context, you usually need this more approximate notion where you allow the, the ratio to be more than e to the epsilon on some delta fraction of the domain. So, and why is this privacy notion even relevant to this problem? And, and the reason it's relevant comes from two very nice properties of differential privacy. The first one is that it composes adaptively, is that you run several differentially private algorithms there, even if they depend on each other, they use outputs of each other, uh, uh, then the resulting algorithm still satisfies differential privacy, of course, which scales with the number of uh, algorithms that you use. And the second property that you need for all this to work is that uh, differential privacy actually implies generalization, and that's what we have uh, proved in this uh, work. And then just combining these two pieces together, you basically, uh, you get that whenever you have an algorithm which answers a query and satisfies differential privacy, then you can use in this adaptive uh, setting. So this is uh, uh, all very nice. It's very cool to be able to transfer techniques from one area to the other to a completely unrelated problem. But differential privacy is still a relatively restrictive notion, and it's not necessarily the right tool for the job. So uh, what we are asking in this work, are there uh, other notions uh, that potentially relax uh, the notion of differential privacy, but still have these attractive properties and uh, uh, potentially allow a richer set of algorithms to be used for, uh, for answering different queries. And that's exactly what we do. We introduce this notion of averagely one out KL stability. That if you, uh, so the algorithm is gamma averagely one out a KL stable. If for all data sets, and now let me parse this, the sum of KL divergences within the distribution, output distribution of the algorithm on the data set S, and uh, the output of the, uh, this uh, algorithm on the data set with the element I removed, uh, the sum of these divergences over all indices I is at most gamma. So it differs from differential privacy in three ways. We're using leave one out, which is, uh, we're using KL divergence instead of the, this kind of infinity divergence, and we are averaging over all indices. It might seem like an arbitrary variation, but actually all these differences are, as far as I know, necessary, and that's the only uh, definition which will have the properties that we are aiming for, that at least I know of. So what are those properties? First of all, it is easy to see that it's kind of backward compatible, that epsilon differential privacy will imply epsilon square uh, stability. It's slightly, there is some difference here uh, in parameterization, and uh, also Relaxed, some relaxed versions of differential privacy will also have to set aside this property. And it also composes adaptively. In this case, it's very easy to see that it's kind of composition of k-gamma stable algorithms, k-gamma uh, k gamma stable. Most interestingly, it, this notion has, uh, implies generalization. And to prove this, we follow kind of this general approach, to, which has also uh, been introduced in a different work with the work uh, at all. Where we first, uh, okay, there we did it for differential privacy and did it in the following way. We first showed that differential privacy, the notion of stability, implies a bound on certain max information, some type of uh, mutual, strong version of mutual information between the data set and the output of the algorithm. And from that uh, notion of max information, we uh, very easily obtain uh, generalization, in fact, with high probability. So here, instead, in contrast, we show that our, uh, this notion of stability that we have introduced, gamma, uh, implies an upper bound on the more standard mutual information between the data set and the algorithm. Uh, specifically, for any data set drawn ID from some distribution P, the mutual information will be upper bounded by gamma N, and it's a very uh, clean uh, statement, it's very easy to prove. And now we need to show that now from 
the fact that this mutual information is bounded, we derive generalization guarantees. And, uh, and, to, uh, and our approach for doing this is based on sort of an, on the known connection that were first discovered by Catoni and McAllister in the context of pack base analysis, and more recently rediscovered by Rousseau and Zhu in the context of adaptive data analysis. Uh, and we give us uh, sort of somewhat stronger variation, at least stronger in some ways than a previous analysis that show that the expected generalization error, this is the difference between the empirical and true mean, uh, is upper bounded by this mutual information, but we also scale it by the variance of the query, which makes it uh, stronger uh, than some of the previous bounds. So, uh, and from here we uh, obtain that these are the kind of generalization guarantees that we have for this notion. Now the question is what kind of algorithms uh, does it allow? And we show that this allows this very natural algorithm that had been considered uh, and people tried to analyze it before, which is called calibrated noise addition, is when you're estimating the mean of some function, instead of uh, uh, adding noise which is proportional to some fixed accuracy, it is proportional to the uh, empirical variance of the, uh, of the value that you're trying to estimate. So basically, in some sense, your noise is uh, roughly on the same scale as the statistical error. Uh, of, uh, of your estimator, uh, although we do ensure that it doesn't get too small. We have like a second order correction, so uh, it, it has to be, the noise has to be at least 1 over n. And for this uh, algorithm, which, uh, we prove that it's very stable in our notion. It's 1 over n ALKL stable. Uh, but if one were to look at its differential privacy guarantees, it they would be on the order of, order of of 1. It would be much, much worse and won't give uh, good guarantees. So now combining these properties of this algorithm with the generalization guarantees and adaptive composition, we get an algorithm which um, answers these statistical queries with error, which is roughly proportional to their standard deviation. It's a little hard to parse this sentence, but it roughly it says that the expectation of the worst case error over all uh, queries, when you scale it by the roughly the standard deviation, but then there is a correction, this second order correction will be small. Uh, it's not so important, but it's, uh, it's a very, uh, basically, that's kind of the, the notion, the whole notion is the reason why we, this algorithm in some sense uh, was the motivating application of, uh, for, this, uh, for this notion, and, 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 and this algorithm brings all the pieces uh, together. So that's it, let me briefly conclude. Uh, so we have introduced this notion of uh, average leave one out case stability. It's less restrictive than the differential privacy, but has uh, the same nice properties, but it also quite a bit easier to analyze, which uh, another uh, nice uh, bonus. One, limitations, uh, one limitation of this notion is does not imply, we don't know whether it implies high probability generalization, like differential privacy does. So it's a natural open problem. We also don't have a counterexample. And of course, it would be interesting to see other algorithms and applications that use this uh, notion. Uh, thank you, and let me know if you Thanks. have any questions. Thanks. Uh, unfortunately, I had to ask uh, the audience to... Okay, I'll be around at the poster session. There's no poster, but I'll be there. Thanks, thanks. Italy again.